this video was originally recorded at the annual Buddhism and Psychotherapy program held at Menla Retreat and Dewa Spa in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. Blind faith is not good because it's weak. But reasonable faith, the reason of relativity, faith in relativity, faith in the field of love is, is good. It's that good old Eric Erickson. He was a teacher of mine as an mm. undergraduate at Harvard. Mm. His white hair. Mm -hmm. He was always he was quite a sweet person. Mm -hmm. But this basic thing was, you know, the first thing for formation of identity was basic trust. Basic trust. Yeah. You know, that's the key thing in yep. people's lives. And I, at the time, I had some friends who really needed it, were brought up in a certain way. And uh, I, you know, I, never mind. That's another story I will tell another time. So, so that's the thing. And that relates to how I manage my own misery, which I will share with you. My own misery is that in this life, 65 years or whatever of studying these wonderful, wonderful analysts, this wonderful analytic tradition of the wisdom traditions, and seeing it even with the help of the Dalai Lama, my teacher, my original Mongolian teacher, I'm still not in a permanent flow state. I'm still not enlightened. I still can't change the world, at least in a different way. I cannot. And so, I, but I have a consolation. And my consolation is through reasoning. Given the infinity of, of continuum energy, conservation of mental energy as well as physical energy, the most subtle type of energy. Mental energy is physical, ultimately. Physical is mental, ultimately. So that's not a problem, ultimately. But relatively, mental is the more subtle physical, super subtle physical. And given the infinity of it, there's no reason to say, I won't attain it, nirvana. I won't become aware of the nirvanic nature of reality. I certainly will, because I have infinite time. I can be stupid and dense and stubborn and crazy and self-masochistic of going through these things endlessly. But since it's endless, that's eventually I'll stumble on a, a, some way out of it. Poetry will meet me, or whatever, mm. or a kind old mother. I'll know she's around the corner. Actually, I'll never know the, grasp the old mother because I am the old mother. Mm. So there's no one who can grasp it in a way. I, but I can somehow give myself to it. So I know I will. And then, by studying Buddha's life, there's a logical thing. Just before Buddha became enlightened, he remembered his own infinite past lives. Then, the minute he did that, he also remembered, sitting under that tree, he became aware of everybody else's infinite past lives. And then in Theravada, in the dualistic Buddhism, they don't mention what that would mean. What would it mean if you realized you had been every single thing infinitely in the past, with full detail? And then you would see everyone else, everything they had ever been in full detail. Then you would realize you've been interrelated with all of them infinitely. And that's, the, just, that's just the event horizon of a field where you are one with all of the beings in what I call the expensive oneness, where you're one with them and yet they're there themselves the way they are. And yet you're also them, that which is inconceivable. It's like if you right now, you right now, each of us is looking out of our apparatus out of our ears and eyes, whatever. And suddenly, we would be everybody looking out of everybody's eye in the room. What would the field of the room feel like if you were, if, you know, if you were empathetic to everybody in the room and, and fully aware of everything they were thinking and what they were seeing and how it was from their perspective? It would be inconceivable. And a Buddha is defined as a being that has that for all life, all life, which is it's not. It's, you can't wrap your head around it, but that's, that's what they said it was. And he then became aware of the different possible futures of all the beings. And then he saw that they, the time was only a construct, not just space, but time also. And then he saw that they could take more or less time to reach their own 
permanent flow state interwoven with everybody else in that field. And then his compassion made him join infinite other Buddhas, which he was also aware of, who are already optimizing all environments for all sensitive beings and creating, because they had no power to just blast them into bliss, but they had at least the ability to shape mm. the learning environment, in a sense, you know, to expand their office mm. <laughs> for the exchange of, of, for the new conversation that gave them a new narrative about themselves, you know, slowly and gradually replacing the old one to make them more viable, right? Mm. To help them find their own viability, I'll mm. put it that way, mm. me, right? So, what that means is that I, will become enlightened. And when I do, and so will all of you, a hundred percent, even if you don't even have an imagination of what that could be like, given infinite time, you'll be infinite. And, and when you do, the reason, why don't we remember our even 100,000 or 5,000 or even 20 of our previous lives? Because we suffered in those lives. And because we think we're suffering now. So we, you know, we luckily that's a way of reacting to trauma is dissociate. So we're dissociated from our past biological experience, not the selfish gene, the selfish us, <laughs> running around with Richard Dawkins' selfish genes, but been the selfish us, and we were suffering with that selfishness as we are suffering now. And but when we realize that that was illusory we then realize we were not really suffering even in all those past times. So we can then remember them. So in other words, we revise our experience of the past completely. And we realize what the reality of that time was in the past. That there is no non-flow state, actually, really. It's just a, it's an ignorance. It's a mis misconception. It's a misunderstanding. It's a misperception. So that means that we will all enjoy being here at Menla, as perfect nirvana, later, <laughs> retroactively, we will enjoy it. And I will enjoy this lifetime that is nearly over, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. uh, fully, retroactively. Mm -hmm. I'll be there with, with I, did, I did help my grandfather mm -hmm. between 92 and 94. He shifted around, he critiqued his nihilism, and he realized he would be reborn. And he started being so much nicer to my mother mm. and to other people and us. And he supported me being a Buddhist monk. Mm. <laughs> Grandpa did. Sent me to India. Mm. And I have a picture of myself as a monk. Mm. And I'm pointing out to bed and the Dharmtala on the map to him. And mm. he's like, mm. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just like that. And as, 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 as Uma said, I look like Henry Miller in drag. <laughs> with my shaved head and my red dress. <laughs> so that's the thing. We'll all be happy now, later. <laughs> you get it? That's the consolation. That's how I bear being miserably frustrated. <laughs> no, I am frustrated. I'm, I'm working three jobs. I'm trying to raise funds to make this place really so it will go on in the future after I croak. If I croak now, it would not, mm. because I'm, my network of connections somehow, there's a little contribution here, a little there, never enough. But you know, it happens, and people come, you know. So I, I, I would like to be able to have the croak. You know, when, when <laughs> Buddha attained enlightenment, what he said was, supposedly he said, deep, peace, luminous, without complication or elaboration, and uncreated meaning primal, you know, has always been here, has always been the condition of everything. It always has been nirvana. It doesn't start. You know, anything that you make by a relational process will dissolve by a relational process. You know, made of causes, it will it has the seeds of its own destruction. So nirvana is just the na nature of everything, the way it is. It's uncreated. Then he says, like an elixir of immortality, like an amrta, you know, which means a, a, a deathless elixir, is the reality I have experienced, he said. 
I experience, even present tense, is the reality I experience. And then he says, whoever I show it to, they will not get it. Mm. Actually, if we use get it in that sense, it's much better. Yeah, than not understand. getting it. Yeah, that's they true. will not get it. Mm. Better I don't say anything and relax here mm. in nature, mm. in the forest. He said that. Mm. Which just meant that, you know, he... He knew that he didn't have power to change other beings. Mm. He, and so no point type of thing, you know. But as a play, without a big serious point, you know, then, then he taught for 45 years. Mm -hmm. But his first thing was saying that. Mm. Whoever I saw, he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't a missionary fanatic. Mm -hmm. Because that won't work. Then mm -hmm. people might believe it out of blind faith, but then that's weak, and then they'll believe something else. Mm. So therefore, one of your job from here on as an analyst or a patient or something is to try to realize you are an analyst because you do realize the preciousness of life and all animal life, but especially human life, because the human is at the threshold of being able to understand the ununderstandable to get the ungettable, to give themselves to the ungettable. The human being is the, is the animal that has somehow circled around and landed by, by ethical self-transcendence in this extraordinary life form of us, which is of this infinite precious because it's at the door of the infinity. Gods are also like at the door, but then they're lounging there. <laughs> They're like in a like hundred year jacuzzi and like, oh I don't care about emptiness. Ah, I'm not gonna analyze anybody, what do I care? Until they die from being a god and then they freak. And they if you read your Pali Sutras, when the monks say Buddha's in his little hut and they'll bother him when somebody comes too late to the to the vihara, to the abode, mm. then you the sutra switches to inside Buddha's cabin mm. and the poor guy is not sleeping because some old friend of his who died and became a god is now leaving that realm and falling down, and they're yeah. scared where they're going. They're saying, Buddha, Buddha, what can I do? And he's speaking to them on this subtle plane where he, because he's aware of everything, everyone. So the poor guy never gets a break. Mm. So, he's sitting in his hut, and he's analyzing King Bimbisara, who's collapsing there, mm. saying, yeah, I'm gonna, I don't know where I'm going. He says, because I didn't really practice enough in my god's time. That's in Pali. Yep. Supposed to be the real naturalistic one. We're just here like Stephen Batchelor walking around mm. in the dust and it's just no big deal. And give me a break. <laughs> it's treason. Mm. That stuff. <laughs> so what you need to do is you need to find your relativity all the time. And when you meditate on it, uh, and the starting of finding your relativity is rea realizing how precious you are. You know billionaires, you can't even meet one, usually, unless you knew them beforehand. And somehow they don't have you blocked by their security and their like different <laughs> weird computer things. But why? Because every minute of their time they think is really precious and valuable. Because if they wasted time and didn't make the right investment or choice, whatever, they might lose two billion out of 20. Right? They didn't get in on Bitcoin just right. So they think they're really important because what things are valued by in this stupid country is money. And they have a lot, so then they're very important. Evolutionary money is what you had to get to be human. And therefore, your time is really valuable and precious. Because the, what you do with your time between now and your death, which just means losing this body, which is a really valuable one because of its intelligence, and its vulnerability, et cetera. What you do between now and then is of Im immense long-term causal evolutionary value to you and everybody that you interwoven with, not just you. And so wasting it, passing it, you know, we say passing time, you know, waiting for Godot, whatever we're doing, like yeah. Mr. Beckett, you know, is, a, is really tragic. And so, but when you meditate, you don't just, buy, okay, I'm, in, I'm gonna have a future life. I might, have, maybe I'll be, maybe I was Cleopatra in the past, or Julius Caesar, you don't do that. What you do is you note your thoughts, and this is like mindfulness. Your stream, your focus is not just the breath, you might start with that, but your focus is 
the preciousness of your life. And you learn a lot of detail why it's so precious. A biological detail from karma theory, you learn. And then, when your mind veers off, it will go into the consensual reality that we're brought up in and we live in. And it will say, come on, what's the big deal? Who, who proves that? What's the evidence? Everybody says MIT, Harvard, Columbia, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, blah, blah. Everybody says when the grown-up modern thing is, scientific thing is when you die, you're dead, and that's it. And that's in our mind still. Total. You'll find that there. That's where your mind will veer off. And then you then you challenge that. Then that's where your curiosity and your doubt should come in. And then you say, okay, who says, who discovered that I'm nothing at death? Or anybody was? Who found that out? And what's their evidence? Who has ever found that? And then you will realize, which it took me 40 years of this debate to really realize, obviously no one ever found that out. There is no evidence for that fact. Not only is there no evidence that a person who dies it becomes, their consciousness becomes nothing, but in principle, you, your common sense can tell you there never will be such evidence because no one ever will discover nothing. Even they have a meditative state of akim jani ayatana, absolute, you know, nothing whatsoever, sort of state of nothing whatsoever. It's just a temporary state made of causes of meditative expertise and concentration, and it comes to an end. The momentum of going in it, then you can't do any more expertise in meditation, so then it wears out. And then suddenly you're back in town seeking an analyst. Speaking of time wearing out. I know, I know. So. <laughs> So I'm saying, that's what you do. You reflect on that. And all of your problems will be solved when you decide, when you really come to respect yourself at a different level. Because you are, every moment of, you know, that people go like Meister Eckhart's reincarnation, Eckhart Tolle, power of now, and everybody gets a buzz by being in the moment. But what is that moment if your underlying feeling is that what you're held by is being nothing? All you have to do is blow your brains out and you're going to be nothing if you want to accelerate the achievement. So that's, but there's no evidence for that. So that would be a blind faith leap. Because it, why you would not be nothing? You would be someone with a headache. And your subtle body would be having a dream of a really serious headache. In fact. So... When you really realize how precious you are, you will not waste your time. You will select a uh, livelihood and environment that will be very beneficial to yourself and others. You will focus on your, you will go back to your analyst and you will try it out, whatever it is, even if it irritates you, you will not give in to your addiction, you will not give in to your depression, you will, you will focus your anxiety on why was it that I believed and so many did that nothing was going to solve all my problems just by dying. Why? How could I ever have been so stupid? And what kind of stupid culture is this that goes around acting like, well, the worst that can happen is we'll all just be nothing. Even if Kim Jong-un and, 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 and Fox head, you know, <laughs> Fox fur head blow us all up, we just don't be nothing. So then we won't care. That's the reckless, reckless, psychotic, cultural behavior that is endangering our planet and ourselves. And how could I have ever been so, sewed up in that? You will realize, and you will absolutely not waste your time. OK? Look, he just turned me off, so that's no, the no, end. I, so thank you. No, no. I know. <laughs> it is time for, time for a pause and time for departure and uh, time to go back on the highway to the land of misery. <laughs> <laughs> But drive carefully because there are degrees. And have a great time. And keep Menla in your heart. And uh, be happy. And uh, be analyzed. And your office isn't even big enough for us all. <laughs> Actually, I haven't even been properly analyzed. Did you say I was having hearing problems? Did you yeah. say you didn't have a conventional because you didn't lie down? I didn't lie down. So no. you said that? I said that. I, heard, I thought yeah, I heard yeah, that. Yeah. So you mean unless you lie down, you didn't do the real thing? I was my my therapists were not ordained. They were up analysts. sitting types. Yeah, yeah, they were up fri sitting. fringe types, <laughs> as am I. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you are a beautiful French type. You're my favorite French type. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much. What is that? This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special invites to trips around the world with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit TibetHouse.us.